Um, I remember actually on the second of June at a conference that I attended, all presentations were about continuous integrable systems, except for one. There was uh, this guy, Yuri Suri, who came and gave a presentation about discrete systems. And I was like, hmm, interesting, cool, but also a bit weird. Because like all the techniques, nothing worked, like everything was completely different. And I was like, okay. So five years later, <laughs> I'm the one giving the presentation on discrete systems. Um, so yeah, okay, so that seems to work. Um, so this is now work with uh, Yuri Suri, who happened to become my boss, and uh, Kang Ning Wei. And let me explain maybe like what is the, I don't know, an example of why uh, this is difficult and nothing works. Um, consider the zhukovsky volterra Giroud system. It's, a, it's this system, just like differential equations, normal, complex. Um, if I would set um, all the, well, let me, first, sorry. If I would set all the betas to zero, so I would only have the alphas, this would be the Euler top. So it's the Euler top with, with some like linear terms being added. It corresponds to a physical system. I don't know, it's putting like a sort of like um, rotor in water. Like there's a way to, to physically do this. Um, and the system is integrable in the, in the physical conditions, so-called, which is like when the sum of alphas is equal to zero. And also when two of the betas are zero. It doesn't matter which ones because it's symmetric. Um, and these are the integrals of motion. It's a very similar story to the Euler top. So um, if, if there's this condition, then like the, these um, integrals also satisfy a relation because obviously we are dimension three. There can only be two conserve, independent conserved quantities. Um, yeah, so this is a more or less um, standard thing. So we assume that we, are, um, we put even one extra condition so here, like, we have two reasons why this should be integrable. Um, and then, regardless of the value of beta zero, of beta two, this should be integrable. That means, in our normal context of continuous systems, that I would have two conserved um, quantities, and then the trajectory would lie at the intersection of these conserved quantities. And this is true for any value of, B, of beta two. Just like the conserved quantities will take different values, but um, I will always be there. Um, Let's, ha let's see what happens though, if we discretize this system, so if we make a discrete version, then for beta 2 equals to 0, we get here many points. This looks like a line, but it's not a line. It's just like many, many points. But you clearly see that it is restricted to the intersection of two things. But if I take any other value, for example 5, then you see that there must be one conserved quantity, but not two. So it looks like the points are kind of restricted to a surface, but certainly not restricted to a curve. Um, so, yeah, so this is a problem. We see something that works in continuous systems but does not work well on discrete systems. But of course here there's many like open questions or things I haven't explained. Um, for example, what is the normal thing? Like, is it, there's no reason why we should expect that the integrability gets preserved. So I don't know if it's, which of the image was the weird one? That for beta 2 equals to 0, it did happen, I did have two conserved quantities, or is it strange that for beta 2 uh, different than 0, I did not have uh, conserved quantities, or not enough. And what do we mean exactly by integrability? Like, can we define it in different ways, maybe, for discrete systems? And most importantly, how do we actually discretize the systems? Maybe there's different ways. Maybe we can improve this. And this will be, the third question will be the focus of the talk. Um, so first, to zoom out, we saw an example. Now I want to explain what is the general setting. Um, we start with a completely integrable system. Um, I think I don't have to convince you guys of why integrable systems are important, um, but in case I have to, um, I would say that, uh, that they appear often in physics and uh, in form of conservation laws, for example, and also like from an applied perspective, so if we have to, for example, apply for funding. Uh, it's interesting to mention that they offer also stability and forecasting in the long term. So we would like to see um, how we can discretize. How can we make a discrete version of these systems? Um, and the problem, as we have seen, is that there's systems that are integrable in continuous that are not integrable in discrete version. Actually, that's normally the case. Normally, if you take any method and you discretize, it, um, it does not work. 
So I take here, for example, the Lotka Volterra, and I discretize using the Euler method that we learned at school. And then instead of having closed orbits, so this is a continuous system, I start here and I kind of start spiraling out. Or if I take the implicit Euler method, I will spiral inward. So I, can, I will always have some sort of like spiraling um, property, which is not good. Um, so what would I like? Because first, um, it's important in, in, in science to denote what would be the ideal outcome. The ideal outcome would be that I start with a completely integrable system and I find a discretization in a certain space. So a map that I apply iteratively with a certain time step. Um, I want that the map, my discretization, approximates the original system, because um, otherwise I would be discretizing something else. Um, I also, if there's Poisson brackets or symplectic structures or things like this, I would like them, if possible, to be preserved, either exactly or an epsilon deformation of them that becomes the original one when epsilon goes to zero. And um, I will not work too much today with this uh, part two, but I will work with the part three. So if there are like a certain amount of conserved quantities in the continuous system, I would like them to also exist in the um, discrete setting either the original ones or the original ones perturbed uh, by the time step. And there's um, many um, discretization methods that we learn at school and stuff, and typically all of them are disastrous when applied to integrable systems. But we found one um, that was a bit uh, forgotten that works a bit better than all the others. Um, there are some limitations, but they are being overcome um, these years. But the first one, the original method only works for quadratic vector fields. But well, that's good, because uh, it's a simple enough problem. And it's uh, basically, you do this substitution. So left, I have the continuous, what I would have in the continuous setting, and then how I discretize it. And, I, and you see that I try to do something that is very symmetric, and in particular is linear in both. Um, so it's a sort of like a mix of implicit and explicit Euler algorithm. Can be also, is part of the family of the Runge Kuta with certain parameters. Um, and it has a very nice properties. One is this one that I mentioned. It is linear with respect to Z tilde and with respect to Z. Um, just a quick question. What is Z tilde? Is that like the next time step or? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. But if, if I consider the Z tildes as variables and the Z as constant, or the other way around, they are, it's clearly linear. It's also clear that if I change the sign of epsilon, then like the tildes and the non tildes swap roles. And uh, it becomes an entity when M becomes zero. So, like if I would bring the, the epsilon here, then this would be just like this. Then. As you were mentioning, <laughs> we can, um, because it's linear, I, I can solve the linear system and then define a discrete dynamical system. So I will have um, z tildes as a function of z. Um, yeah, I can always do it because also if epsilon is small enough, like the matrix will always be non singular. So this always have a solution for epsilon small enough. And um, so I will obtain a map that will depend, it will be z tilde as a function of z and epsilon. And for free, I obtain its inverse. Um, also, uh, by Kramer's rule, actually, these maps, if you know what a de determinantal map is, this is a determinantal map, because it can be expressed as quotients of determinants. So it will be basically like polynomials divided by polynomials, and the denominator is always the same polynomial. Um, and so it's a rational map, but it has an inverse. And the inverse is also rational, because it's just changing one sign. Um, so this is what it's called like birational maps, and it's good because uh, within the very difficult realm of <laughs> algebraic geometry, um, birational maps, we know some things about birational maps, more than about only irrational maps. Um, so this method was actually introduced in some unpublished notes, so like a bit as an addition, as a curiosity, uh, but was not part of the main <laughs> lecture. Um, and then um, Hirota and Kimura, apparently unaware of Kahan's work, um, wrote two papers showing the, the very surprising properties of this method. And here is where like, the method became famous. And this was in the year 2000. One was about the Euler top and the other one the Lagrange top. We will see a bit why um, these papers are important. And then it got picked up 
in, uh, in a few groups like uh, in the TU Berlin where I am now, also in Norway and also in, uh, in Melbourne and also other um, universities in Australia and New Zealand. But this is something relatively recent. Um, because these papers were a tiny bit cryptic, so it was like hard to understand what was the core, what was the idea behind. Um, but this is what uh, makes like a good seminal paper that there's many, it raises many open questions and then you have to try to understand all like uh, um, loops. So uh, let me first show a very different example, a very similar, uh, a very simple example of this method. Uh, I take the Weierstrass uh, differential equation, which is very simple and it's integrable. So it's a, uh, does this have a pointer? No, okay. Um, as, yeah, but this is, Ooh. Okay. Okay. So here, so it's, a, it's a, in, an equation of second degree, but I can re rewrite it. I can rewrite it in, in, uh, in two dimensions and, and first order, and then I can apply this kind of creation. Um, here, there's a divided by two missing. Um, and then, actually, it has very nice properties. It does conserve a volume form. Um, it it has an integral of motion. And both objects, when epsilon becomes to zero, they become the original object. So this will be one, and uh, this part will disappear, basically. So I will recover the original thing. So this is like a canonical example. This works very well. So at least we have one method that, in one example, works well. That's already more than uh, what we had. So this is what typically happens. This is the ground truth, the continuous system. Then you took the Euler method, even with a small time step, you start spiraling. And uh, then you have the Gahan discretization, and even with a bigger time step, you see that it preserves the original um, shape. So this is very good. Let me show you another example. This is the one that Gahan actually originally studied. Um, so it's just like Claude Cavalterra. And it does have an integral, but here the integral is non algebraic, so we have a logarithm. So this will bring some problems, but he didn't know. Um, we have the same algorithm, um, and then when we have this equation, we can solve for x tilde and y tilde, and we get the map, which is, again, um, birational. So we say it's polynomial divided by polynomial, and the denominator is always the same. And um, we also see that uh, if this is the ground truth, and this is the picture that I showed you in, in the very beginning, we have spiraling, sorry, spiraling, in the Euler method, and we do not have it um, for the Gahan discretization. So you said at the beginning you want the intervals of motion to either be the same or close. Which are they in this case? Are they actually the same or are they close? Neither. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so here I, I spent some time picking the right initial condition, okay. because if you pick the wrong initial condition, then you get also here like uh, something ugly. So this system does not have a conserved quantity, okay. but it does have, uh, it preserves the, the volume form. Um, but this was like uh, discovered later. So this is a bit of a like intermediate example, but it is, it's okay that this does not work because the integral was not algebraic. So we can at least restrict our hopes, but say, okay, maybe if it's algebraic, then it's always good. Um, and this is the, the example that gave a lot of hope. This is the Lagrange stop. So if we write it in, in these coordinates, it has like a six dimension, so it's a differential equation in six dimensions. Um, it has a, a liposome bracket, and so there's two Casimir functions and two integrals of motion, so dimension six, and then two I'll go out with a Casimir, and then integral of motion with a liposome, so it's, it's integrable, we're good. Um, so this is what the Gahan discretization looks like if you, if you write it in Mathematica, which as you guys know, that's uh, my specialty. Um, so the paper was very short, and it kind of gave all the ingredients to build this, but obviously there was no, there was, this was not written in the paper. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna like use this as a, as a recipe book, and like follow all the steps, and see if I get the map, and if I get the conserved quantities, and I did. So this is the map. This is the first integral of motion. Uh, you can very clearly see that it's a polynomial divided by a polynomial. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's remarkable that, you know, the integral of motion is like this. Um, and that you said this is an integral of motion of that map. 
Um, this is the second integral of motion. Again, I'm reducing the, the font, also polynomial divided by polynomial. Um, this is the third integral of motion. I'm reducing the font a bit every time. And this is the fourth, because if you paid attention, there was like a cyclic coordinate, so uh, this one was conserved automatically. And actually, there's a list of examples in which this works or works somehow. That means we get at least some of the conserved quantities and often even all of them. So this gave a lot of hope in the community. Oh, wow, this method was like, it was a perfect story. Yeah? Like, oh, I got for a method, and then you open, you see it, oh, and suddenly it works for all examples. This uh, was very encouraging. Um, but then came the bad news. And the bad news is that um, even in two dimensions, there's an example where this does not work. So these are like very simple systems in, in two dimensions. Um, so the systems on the left are integrable as continuous time systems. But the systems on the, well, then I do the Kahan discretization. But the corresponding Kahan method is not integrable. Does not have any conserved quantity. You can show, I mean, it's difficult to show that something does not have conserved quantities, but you see it has like chaos and mess, and like it's, the solutions clearly don't lie on lines. Um, but then this was the second wave of hope in the community, um, which was that in some cases, in exactly these two cases, to be more precise, and one is a particular case of the other, so in one case, um, we can correct um, the Cahan discretization. What does that mean? We can add some terms, these terms depend on the time step, so I don't violate the first condition, so when epsilon goes to zero, I still recover the original system. It's unclear why these terms are not other terms, but the thing is that I can modify the way I, dis I discretize my system so that the corresponding, uh, so that the result has a conserved quantity. So this raised the question, okay, can all discretization, can all Cahan discretizations be corrected? All the ones, so, all the ones except for those, those list of 10 that, uh, that are not integrable, can they be corrected to be made integrable? Um, to explain a bit what this, what this maps looks like, to do the research we need uh, some algebraic geometry, yeah? Sorry, I'm gonna ask a question from like four slides yeah. ago, but it's gonna just be Sue's question again, which is uh, you, when you have those like insane long formulas, if you like plug epsilon equals zero, do you get the yeah. original? So that's a, so those are like perturbations of the original. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. So that's just the very. I mean, you know, it's like it's, it's a book example. It's like fantastic. Um, so in general, we will have um, a map <clears throat> of this form. So like the next step is a function of the previous step and epsilon, and all these are polynomials, and the denominator is always the same. So the numerators change, the denominator is always the same. And we have the inverse, which is changing sign. Um, so to work with these methods a bit more like in detail, it's better to consider them as variational functions in projective spaces. Um, and then you can use homogeneous coordinates, and then you put the denominator as, a, as an extra coordinate. What you win is that this map is not rational, but is, or I mean, these are polynomials. These are all polynomials. So the computer um, is happier with polynomials and with rational functions. Um, and then there's two sets that are important when we have these sort of maps. One is the critical set, which is when we lose injectivity, and uh, the other one is the indeterminacy set, which is when it's not defined. So basically, here would be uh, numerator and denominator equal to zero simultaneously, or if you look at here, is a, a, a map with all homogeneous coordinates equal to zero. And then these are kind of very determining sets when analyzing a map. So this is a bit what we play with. Um, so these corrections, in, we had exactly one example, or two examples, but one is a particular case of another one, where we had this correction. And this correction was found by comparing it with already existing collections of birational maps. So basically you went to the library, you looked at with all the like, birational maps that you knew in two dimensions, and you said, okay, this is more or less similar. Can I tweak the coefficient so that it fits this one? Yes, and that's how they made it. So it was like, okay, it seems interesting to study this family better to see if we can make our library larger. Um, so this, uh, this library is like a QRT maps, um, already well known, and, uh, but I will make a super short explanation. So imagine we have like a, a curve, so a polynomial of by degree two represents a curve. 
And um, because it's of by degree two, if I take a point and I take the horizontal line, I will intersect, there will be two solutions. So I, will, I can go to the other one, this is the horizontal switch. And then I can um, do the same, but in the vertical direction. These two operations themselves are involution. So if I do this twice, I go back to the original point, and if I do this twice, I go to the original point. But their um, composition is non-trivial. But it's clearly that, okay, here we'll have a complicated map, but I will never leave this curve, because I've only defined it on this curve. Then this is the trick to then extend this map to the whole plane, finding a family of curves. If I take two curves, I can consider linear combinations of these two curves, and then I can kind of brush all the plane, and then given a point, I, I pick the curve that passes through this point, and then I have this map. And this is how I can define a map in general. Um, this works except in the base set. The base set is where like both curves are zero, so there will be like few points where this does not work because all curves go through this point, but for all the other points it will work, so it's fine. Um, as I said, outside of these like uh, critical points, like all the, well they are not critical, um, outside of these points I can pick a curve and do this game. Um, instead of working in C2, as I said, it's better to compactify everything in projective spaces. Here you have two options, essentially P2 or P1 cross P1. Uh, and for us, better P1 cross P1. Um, so then this base set is a, are eight points, often summarizing infinity, but you can see here what happens. So here we have many curves of this family. In principle, through each point, there's only one curve passing, except for this like, base set. Here we see four of these eight points, where all curves pass through. So, okay, for here, in these points, we cannot define the map. This will be our indeterminacy set. But for all the other points, we can define the map. And, um, yeah, so we take a point, we look for the curve, and we play the game. And this map is a security map, and it's a birational map. So I explained the, the, um, the geometric construction of this map, but you can construct it algebraically, and it's birational, it has all the nice properties. And these are like very well studied. Um, and it always, they always have an integral of motion because you never leave the curve because that's how we define it. So um, an important particular case is if we have symmetry x and y. Um, because then we can reduce a bit the game. So instead of going horizontal and then vertical, I can go horizontal diagonal, horizontal diagonal. So I can break the process into two parts, and the composition will be my original map. But these are polynomials. So basically, this will have square root the degree of the original map, uh, which is good. Um, the question is, can we generalize this to three dimensions? Because my original problem was in three dimensions. But this construction was good, but it only works in two dimensions. Can we generalize it to three dimensions? Somehow. Um, so not always, but under certain conditions, yes. There have been other generalizations of QRT to three dimensions, but they were not suitable for like uh, for Kahan discretization. So we had to kind of make our own. Uh, is it possible? So if you blow up these eight points, there's a biregular integral system. Say that again. If you blow up the eight base points, you, you get a family of elliptic curves, and it becomes a biregular. Integral system now, or yeah, yeah, you can blow up the singularities and, and kind of regularize. And is this like an autonomous version of a different Panavay equation or something? Um, I don't know because um, the problem with discrete pine levé is that sometimes you don't have an integral of motion in the classic. Sure, sure, but yeah. you have these autonomous versions where the it becomes uh -huh. a piece of elliptic curves. Is this explaining this book of Deustermatt? He has this large book. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, it's uh, just, can be, can be. I think it is, yes. It's uh, just you get an elliptic surface and you get a divisor and a shift by it. Okay. Yeah, so it is. Uh, yeah. Okay, so first step, we will do this in two steps. One is, um, as we define first a map on a curve, now we will define a map on a quadric. On a quadric surface. So let's take a quadric surface. Quadric surfaces have two rulings. This means that I can express them as uh, the union of straight lines in two different ways. So through each point, and these lines are skew, pairwise skew, and then like through each point there's two lines, so one per family. 
uh, crossing. So I will use this instead of my plane. I take uh, a pencil of quadrix, which will play the role of the pencil of curves before. Um, this will induce me a vibration on the, my original quadrix. And then I can play the game. So maybe... So I have my, my quadrix. And then I take another pencil of quadrix that will define me here curves. And then I can kind of, I will have these two straight lines. So then I can play the game of the horizontal switch and the vertical switch. So the same thing, but instead of doing it on the plane, I do it on the quadrant. The degrees are a bit higher, there's some complications, but it's not the end of the world. Um, so yeah, so I take a point, I will have a horizontal switch, and I will have a vertical switch, and I can define this map. And this, this works well, it's not, uh, it's not complicated. And if I have like a, a symmetry, for example, like swapping uh, linear symmetry, for example, swapping the last two coordinates, then I can play again this game of the root. And the composition of the map will be, the composition of the map with itself, the root with itself will be the original map. So same, same story. Um, so good, it looks good. We have it already in one quadric. I take then a pencil, I brush all the space, and then I'm done. Um, so I take, instead of taking my quadric P, now I take a pencil. Um, and then what we would like, that's what we would call a 3D generalization of QRT, is that the map leaves all the quadrics of both pencils invariant, and if I restrict it to a quadric, then it looks like this. This is what I would like. Uh, but it, this does not work. Like the naive approach, if I just like, construct this as I described it, it does not work. Because like some square roots appear, so the maps are not birational, so it's problematic. Then, the question is, can I maybe then put some restrictions, some conditions somewhere so that this does work? Um, and the answer is yes. So, um, if the pencil is separable, and I haven't defined what separable means, then it works. And what does separable mean? It means that I can write it um, like this. So, product of planes minus uh, product of planes. So that the two quadrics are actually the generator. Or I can pick in this family, of infinite, in this family that I brush the space with, I can pick two quadrics that are the generate. This does not always happen. But if it happens, um, so they will be product of planes, um, like for, except for like this one and this one, all the other quadrics will be non-degenerate. Eh? So there's only two elements in this one parameter family that are degenerate. Um, then the base set will not be eight points anymore. It will be four lines. Which will be intersections of these planes. And you can compute this map that I described geometrically. You can, you can work it algebraically in coordinates. And you get um, something like this, uh, where t's, the t0 and the t2 are polynomials of degree 4. And then the x is uh, just your x, so it will be in degree 5. This is the root. So here we are, I'm assuming the symmetry all the time. Um, exactly. Um, so you had two pencils initially, which one is separable? One of them, the P in this case. Um, yeah, so if, if one of them goes <coughs> in reverse, the construction is symmetric. <coughs> um, yeah, so in principle I would have composition of these okay. two things of degree 5, but if, I, if they are like symmetric then I can define these roots. Um, yeah, so as I said, in, in principle it's of degree 25, which is quite horrible. Um, but if I have the symmetry, then I have degree 5, which is much better. But the Gahani squareization should be of degree 3, not of degree 5. So, I mean, 5 is better than 25, but 3 would be better than 5. Um, so I have to do something about this. This means that since this is homogeneous coordinates, I have to find a common factor, this t0 and this t2, that were polynomials of degree 4, should have a common factor of degree 2. And I can kind of try to enforce this, to try what, to analyze what does this look geometrically, what, uh, what has to happen so that this uh, is the case. So under which circumstances um, this happens. And we found two solutions to this, to this question. We don't know if they are the only solutions, but we know that there are at least two solutions. One 
is uh, the so-called case one, um, which is the, the, the two pencils are separable, not only one, but both. Um, so they can be, the quadrics are essentially degenerate, or I can find two quadrics in the family that are degenerate. Um, I'm assuming also invariant, because otherwise I would still be in degree 25. Um, so we saw that the first pencil had these four lines as base set, the second pencil will have other four lines um, in the, as base set, and then I can kind of see what these lines look like together, and we found that if four, either these four lines or these four lines, uh, essentially it's the same case to renaming U3 and U4, um, if they belong to the same quadric, then the resulting map will be of degree 3, so they will have this common factor. So, um, just in case your algebraic geometry is not super fresh, uh, three lines, three skew lines, would define me a quadri. So four is, an, is a condition. Three would be, I can find a, a quadri such that it satisfies this, but four is a condition. So this does not always happen. This is sort of the generis if you want. But if this happens, then I get a map of degree 3. Case two, so second answer to the question, is when the two pencils have one quadric in common. So they brush the space, but there's one moment that they coincide. Um, then basically I can uh, reshuffle the things so that um, I get also two pairs of planes. So like uh, I can factorize the T2 and T0, and uh, this, uh, this and, sorry, this one and this one will be pairs of planes, because they depend on two coordinates. <coughs> So in both cases, I get um, a map of degree 3. The maps are a bit different, um, but there's some intersection between the cases. And um, let's now see, this was like the dry geometric part, now I'm going to move to the more the dynamics. Um, first, a case that was also presented by Hiroto and Kimura, um, which is the other top. So we have this, uh, the original equations that we saw. We saw the Zhukovsky Volterra, so this is with all the betas equal to zero. We do the um, yeah. discretization. And the continuous map has three integrals, but they are related by, uh, by a condition. And so does the Kahan discretization. So here the map is much less spectacular than the one that uh, was the yeah. branch top. Um, but it is still very remarkable that it has uh, three conserved quantities, which of course they are related, and both the conserved quantities and the relation is an epsilon perturbation of the original continuous object. So this is also like a super beautiful book example. And um, from these conserved quantities, I can put them like this and take this as my lambda and this make pencil. So having a pencil is the same as having a conserved quantity. Um, so I can redefine them as pencils if I want and they, they kind of, you see they are planes. So I can do the game, and then I show that this is part of case one. Actually, it's part of case one and of case two. Um, so I can write it in particular as the composition of um, a symmetry, and then, um, sorry, so first the involution along a straight line, and then the symmetry, or first the symmetry, and then the involution along a strong line. I can choose. Um, but this map, let's say, would belong to this category. So, uh, well, actually, obviously, this we've done the other way around. So we first analyzed how this map was built, and that was the inspiration for our generalization of QRT. Uh, could I ask a stupid question? Hi. Uh, so just, just on the definition of the map, so you have two pencils. Yeah. So you pick a point in the space, there is a quadri from the first pencil, quadri from the second pencil through the point, you intersect them, you get a curve. And on that curve, to do the map, you need to take the ruling. <clears throat> Does it matter if you take the ruling from the first conic or from the second conic, or is that the same? Um, that's a good question. If you don't put any conditions, I think it would not matter. But if you want that, for example, one is a separable one, then... So in many examples you have to kind of, there's an order. But I think otherwise, maybe not. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's kind of weird because, I mean, you already have the foliation, so it's... Yeah. But then it looks like you can have two different 
discrete dynamics because you can use rulings from either of them, but maybe they coincide. I, 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 I would love to check about this. Okay. Um, but yeah, indeed, it's uh, just to, in case someone got a bit lost, um, we are indeed trying to construct this from the beginning. So I'm already trying to build maps that have two concept quantities by construction. Yeah. And that's how I'm, I will try to solve the problem. Yeah, but because, I mean, if, if they're different, then they commute. So you actually get two maps with the same concept quantities. Yeah. Um, OK. Uh, so let's go back to another example. Let's not go back. This is another example. This is an intermediate example between what we've seen now and we saw in the beginning. Um, so this was one. So here I take only, I, I rem remind how this was in the beginning. And I said there are two cases in which this is integrable. So I'm going to take not the case I was considering first, but the other case, this one. If I consider this other case, um, then so sorry, yeah, so if I consider this case, then I do have two concept quantities. So Kahan also works in this case. Um, and I can also like see them as pencils, and I can uh, also see that they are like separable, and it also works. So this is also an example of case one. Uh, this one is not uh, case two, this is only case one. Um, so same idea, I can write them also in this method. So like we have already two examples that, that fit in this family. Um, and let's go now to our original problem with which we started the talk, um, which was the uh, Zhukovsky Volterra with two betas. This is the Kahan discretization of the, of the system. Um, so I eliminated the beta 3. And this system, we saw that the points laid on a surface but did not lie on a curve. So we had one conserved quantities but not two conserved quantities. So this is the concept quantity that we always have. Um, and it is an epsilon perturbation of the original one. So this is good. And, but yeah, but it's not enough because we only have one, we would like to have two. But there is a particular case in which we can have two. Um, but it's a very, I don't know, I have to give a lot of conditions on the parameters. So it's a very, you know, it's a bit like a, a very degenerate if you want part of the family. But then, if this is the case, then I get another conserved quantity, which is also perturbation of the original one. But then, we were like, okay, we have a family for which this does not work, and we have this like element here that is like a mushroom that we don't know where this comes from. Um, so, uh, two results that, uh, that I want to present. First is that the mushroom is not a mushroom. It's not an isolated case. I can build a one-parameter family of integrable systems uh, that have that one as a limit. So it's just, just the limit of a family. Um, so we can create this one-parameter family. Um, this is what they look like. So delta would be here like my, my parameter. And they, all these members in the family have an additional conserved quantity. So they're integrable, they have two conserved quantities. And um, so this is one, this is the one that we always had. So this one is independent of delta. And this is the, the extra that we get, which depends on delta. So there is a limit. And these are like uh, constructed um, in the case one. And this is our like uh, main result, which is that we managed to correct the system that we had in the very beginning of the talk. And this is a case two. Um, so this was until here was the original um, discretization, and we have to add these terms that depend on epsilon square. Uh, but you see that they are like uh, not uh, symmetric, so like they don't come from the Kahan recipe. So it's something that we've added. This we had to tweak. But if we tweak the system, then we manage to to discretize. So this has two conserved quantities. Um, this one and this one. Um, so we could finally correct the discretization of the Zhukovsky Volterra zero start with two betas, which was a problem that had been open for 12 years. So we were very happy. And now with this correction, we see that also for any other value of beta 2, we don't get points in a surface, but we get these points on a line. So we are good. 
And actually, the, by accident, the result is a bit more general. We have even one parameter more. Um, so this, if, if the alpha condition is satisfied, then it's the original system, but you could also remove this condition and it would still work. But this uh, is not a physical system or we don't know what this system could be. Um, but this, this family of systems admit in continuous sense two conserved quantities and our discretization would also have two conserved quantities. So a bit um, as a summary, as a wrap up of what we've seen. Um, we've seen that in general discretizations, if I use a normal method, discretizations of integrable systems are not integrable. So we saw like with the Euler method, for example, that we have like spiraling behavior. Um, however, among all the methods available, this Kahan is a bit less bad than all the others because we have at least some examples and some very surprising ones like the Lagrange stuff where this works uh, by default. So this is already very impressive. Um, however, I mean, it's a bit better than the other methods, but still there's, I don't know, like 10 examples where it works and 10 million where it does not. So it would be good if we would find other ways to, to solve this. Um, and the path to approach this problem seems to be this correction. So there seems to be that even when the Cahan discretization is not integrable, we can add some terms, maybe like to modify a bit the constants, maybe, maybe add something that depends on the variables, maybe higher order. Um, you don't have a, some clear limitation or some clear image about what this correction should look like. Um, but we know that they, at least in some examples, are possible. We had an example in two dimensions, and now we managed to find an example in three dimensions. So this gives us hope that, at least in these dimensions, maybe many other examples will be possible. Um, but to do so, you need to have first like a library of, of models to compare with. And, um, and this um, library we try to, to do by generalizing this QRT construction that is very well known in two dimensions, generalize it to, to three dimensions, actually of QRT roots, so not the, the horizontal and vertical, but horizontal and diagonal, so that we get maps of degree five and not degree 25. Uh, and we saw that uh, this would give us maps of degree five, but we could put some geometric conditions to obtain maps of degree three, which is what we needed for our initial problem, but I don't know, maybe we could also study the degree five ones. Um, and yeah, so this was like, uh, we had these two cases. Um, case one, which was like where the two pencils were separable, and these four lines lied on a quadric, and case two, when the two pencils had a quadric in common. And um, this allows us to create new integrable systems. So not only restrict to the ones we know from physics and try to like modify something, but uh, we can just build as many as we want uh, with these tools. As many as we want, maybe we should, I don't know. Correct the sentence. Uh, but in any case, we can, for example, we managed to create this one parameter family that had that known system as a limit, and we could find also this correction of this uh, system with two betas. Um, yeah, which is uh, exactly this one. And um, with all this, I would like to thank you all for your attention.